Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Philosophical Talks of the Research Center for the History and Circulation of Philosophical Ideas. Our special guest today is Professor Stefan Lorenz Zorner. The dialogue is occasioned by a large interest of our philosophical community towards one of his last books on transhumanism, but we hope to find out more about his next book, We Have Always Been Cybers. Let me recall you that Professor Zorner is chair of the Department of History and Humanities and a philosophy professor at John Cabot University in Rome. He is director and co-founder of the Beyond Humanism Network, fellow at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, visiting fellow at the Ethics Center of the Friedrich Schiller University in Vienna. He is editor of more than 10 essays collections and author of many monographs from which we call Metaphysics Without Truth, on transhumanism, and we have always been cyborgs. In addition, he is editor-in-chief and founding editor of the Journal of Post-Human Studies, a double-blind peer review journal published by the Penn State University Press since 2017. Furthermore, he is in great demand as a speaker in all parts of the world, meaning World Humanities Forum, Global Solutions Workshop, Biennial Arte Venezia, TED Talks, and regular contact person of national and international journalists and media representatives. So we are more than glad and honored that you have accepted our invitation. Welcome, Stefan. So good to see you, even online after so much time. Oh, many thanks for that kind of introduction and for having me here. You're welcome. So we are eager to talk to you about your last projects. But first of all, we would have a challenge for you. We would like to take the time back. Uh, at the moment when your first reputed philosophical debate that fired up the entire academic community was created around your article, Nietzsche, the Overhuman and Transhumanism, which was published in 2009 in the Journal of Evolution and Technology. At that moment, um, some experts in the philosophy of Nietzsche became fascinated by your reading of transhumanism and posthumanism as genealogically linked to his works. And some other voices became somehow concerned, let's say, by your arguments that liberal eugenics inspired by the echoes of the overhuman on transhumanism might be morally justified. So I would like to ask you, how does it come that you consider this thesis as you did more than 10 years ago? And if you would have to modify something to that article now, given your experience, given your knowledge, what would it be? Yeah, this has really been an article which was received extremely strongly. It might be interesting for you to know sort of how it came about because it was originally presented at a conference which mm -hmm. was um, co-organized by the University of Jena together with the uh, Uhera Center at the University of Oxford. So it was uh, organized. So in Oxford, there was uh, Julian Savulescu who was responsible for it. And as part of the team then, um, then it was Nick Bostrom under Sandberg, and they were all coming over to Jena in order to discuss issue, issues concerning um, um, gene, gene ethics, basically. It was a really a very focused debate. And, and I've already been dealing with sort of transhumanist issues for, for a long time um, at that stage. Um, but um, sort of my personal background has always been strongly related to Nietzschean philosophies and how I developed my approach. So that really gave me the chance to put together these two approaches and to develop a Nietzschean type of transhumanism uh, myself. So that was the initial central uh, cornerstones for developing the argument. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was already in these circles, it, it has been received extremely strongly. And I was encouraged to um, submit it to the Journal of Evolution and Technologies and, and where it was published. And then in the meantime, it actually it became, this is one of the most cited Nietzsche articles ever, um, which was, which was um, quite, quite striking because I know I basically, when you think about sort of how much effort you put into, into the various articles and you never know how, how strongly they get received and suddenly and this was something based on, you know, I've had a, both, a strong background in both, both of the fields. And, and by, by placing that together, it somehow hit the nerves of many intellectuals and scholars. And then it was received first in the community of transhumanists. There was a special issue being published by the Journal of Evolution and Technology, then a special issue by Nietzsche scholars in the Agonist, then, then an entire book collection, and then many more actually um, essay collections, symposiums were dedicated to that. And, and because, there's sort of to understand sort of the relevance because there was such an interest uh, in, in, in transhumanist circles, many people have re referred to Nietzsche, but there was no real Nietzsche expert. 
so there was a loose association. Some transhumanists affirmed Nietzsche, others did not. Um, and in the, Nietzsche in the Nietzsche community, it was the same thing. Um, and and in the Nietzsche community, most don't really have a, didn't at that time, at that stage, they didn't have a very good crowding on, on definitely not on transhumanism. They hardly knew what transhumanism is. And there's also not le less familiarity concerning issues concerning applied ethics. So it was a very good way of placing that together. And here, most of the Nietzsche scholars have been extremely reluctant to take on board sort of transhumanism, to seeing the correlations between the Nietzschean and the transhumanist way of thinking. However, some other Nietzsche scholars also recognize the striking similarity as, as a consequence of me having shown that there is a structural analogy between their ways of thinking. And the various arguments I've been presenting in that, in that article are, are still valid. I'm actually I'm making the points even more strongly today than, than, than I, I used to make them um, then. Um, maybe the one thing, because you asked sort of what would you have changed mm -hmm. concerning the, art, the issues of philosophical uh, standpoints I presented in, in that article, there's at the very end, um, sort of, I, 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 I made a reference to sort of the religious dimension. And this is sort of where one could make a lot of more insights could be presented. But I think even, even in that respect, the argument still holds, which I've presented in, in that article. Um, it's a question concerning the ultimate foundation for why you hold the values you hold on to. Mm -hmm. um, and in Nietzsche, there is that additional dimension. There's an additional dimension which is being founded in, in his theory of the eternal recurrence of everything, um, whereby he stresses there's a possibility of providing an imminent meaning, um, even for the values you uphold, which is absent in, in most of the transhumanist perspectives. And I think that is actually... I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't call it a religious dimension or it might be a quasi religious. It's definitely, it's definitely a dimension which goes beyond sort of the traditional empirical studies, scientific studies, because, because it, it sort of the theory of the eternal recurrence is one which you cannot prove scientifically. However, the various, the various premises needed to render the eternal recurrence theory as a cosmological theory as plausible are all being supported by, by scientific studies today. And there are even physicists today who regard it as plausible. And so I've actually decided to develop the argument a bit further in my forthcoming monograph on we've always been cyborgs and to stress, no, there is an importance in particular as philosophers, but also like just for the lay person, uh, anyone, it, it's the issue of having the sort of the question of a meaning in life is, is an important personal issue. And, and I think by referring to these dimensions, by, by referring also to the, um, to the theory of the crate here in Heraclitus or the eternal recurrence in, in Nietzsche, that, that is a plausible way of rendering a, a theory of meaning uh, as a possible option, which appeals to scientifically minded thinkers, who appeals to thinkers who have an, a grounding in the empirical world, mm -hmm. um, rather than to imagine um, a world in a, in a, in a non-empirical realm, which is not, not scientifically accessible, which is sort of related to the traditional dualistic humanistic structures. And so uh, I, I think I've I will present um, a much more developed argument concerning the meaning giving functions of the values in transhumanism actually in the forthcoming, forthcoming manner crowds, which I've already highlighted as part of the, this article on Nietzsche and transhumanism. What I enjoy most when I read your works is that there is always a red wire from one perspective to another. And this is how we can map your project and your thinking as a whole. Okay, so we had this very important moment uh, 10 years ago back, yeah? And since that moment until now, something happened. Transhumanism evolved. 
and so did metahumanism, a term that you have coined together with Jamie Duvall in 2010. Uh, in what concerns post-humanism and transhumanism, which are now quite popular, we live within them, we know how to deal with such intellectual topics. But in what concerns metahumanism, if I understand correctly, it is a blended ideology that advances, at least methodologically to say so, the tools of critical post-humanism. So to deconstruct indeterminacy, plurality, hybridity, movement, and the body against control and domination, thus radically counteracting, to say so, the major humanist and transhumanist paradigms. And the major actor of metahumanism is, as you have designed, it a um, cluster of elements that defines the rationality of our anthropocentric nature, free will, and autonomy being the core elements in this context. So, as I teach biopolitics, I am interested in two particular aspects that emerge from how you have framed metahumanism 10 years ago. And the first aspect is the following one. Is metahumanism compatible with biopolitics? And secondly, what kind of political terms would embrace metahumanism? As point number four states that, and I quote, just a second, a radical pluralist politics is a non-paternalist movement that works through power structures to avoid the re-totalitarianization of politics. It does not aim at an ideal final state, but stresses the need to permanently overcome contemporary challenges which arise by necessity through combining the immanentism proposed by the metahuman with the perspectivism of the post-human, stressing the importance of movement versus identity. So what's biopolitical there and what kind of political terms can metahumanist uh, thinking embrace? Oh, many things. That's a really extremely important question. And in particular, sort of if you see the developments his historically, how we got to the issues we are currently dealing with. Uh, so firstly, yeah, exactly, you're right. So before 2010, transhumanism wasn't, wasn't very much of a big issue. Critical post-humanism, maybe a bit more so in academic circles, but both of these have flourished enormously in, in the past 10 years in the academic, but also outside of the academic context. I mean, at the beginning of the, of the 2000s, Habermas still said about transhumanism, it's, it's a small group of freaked out intellectuals who've been sitting in front of the computer for, for too long, who are luckily not being received outside of academia so far. But this is definitely not the case in the past 10 years, because now it has entered you know, many Silicon Valley leaders affirm transhumanism. Elon Musk re regards himself as a transhumanist. We, we, we see transhumanism as part, of, as part of many Netflix films, as part of films or series from, from Amazon Prime. In particular, Black Mirror is extremely striking, but it also shows up in novels like, like Inferno from Dan Brown and many other movies. So it has really been received widely in, in and outside of academia and sort of when I present my students with, with the ideas related to transhumanism, critical posthumanism, and they're all familiar with them just by having watched a lot of Netflix series. And as a consequence, it is also gained a, a lot of further attention in, in, in academia. Mm -hmm. And yes, and the issue of, of biopolitics, what you're stressing, this is, this is where most of the central features come together. So and, and you're perfectly spot on with the description of, of metahumanism. As, as, as bridging the gap between transhumanism and critical posthumanism. And this is at least my take on, 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 on metahumanism. I, I must also stress at the same time, sort of um, Jaime del Valls, who's, a, a, who's an artist, philosopher, intellectual um, from, from Spain, with whom I've, I've coined metahumanism uh, together. He's got a slightly different take on, on these issues. So he, he, he's more critical concerning transhumanism and he's, he's a metahumanism as a further development concerning, concerning critical posthumanism. But we all have a, we have a core of, a core of, of foundational uh, premises which we share and which, which have been highlighted in the metahumanist manifesto. And that's why, yes, 
um, these are not necessarily related to any any specific type of of, of biopolitics, any specific type of also political uh, understanding, and they can be they can be uh, associated and they can be applied in many different types um, of of contexts. And the way and the way and the premise which you've just been reading and the sort of the paragraph you've just been reading from the manifesto um, directly highlights also the. The, the basic fund, the structures, how, how this thinking can be applied. So in, in contrast to most other political philosophies who aim to you know, have some type of utopia and also many transhumanist approaches actually try to highlight, this is sort of the utopia we're trying to head for. This is what we, 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 we aim to achieve as a final goal. And um, it is stressing, no, there is no, any utopia is dangerous. And, and trying to strive to realize such a utopia means you sacrifice, you sacrifice contemporary interest for an ideal future which can never get realized. Mm -hmm. However, and, and this is what, what meta-humanist approach does, we share a couple of central insights, intuitions, values, which we, we realized as an enormously important achievements. And, and these are related, yes, to, to negative freedom. These are related to plurality, relationalism. And that means, and, the, and, and as an extremely central feature, the avoidance of paternalistic structures. So um, we try to avoid that, that the various entities, various persons can try to realize their tribes and effects in the best possible manner. And that doesn't mean that, that anyone is allowed to do um, anything. This is not the anything goes, because obviously there are always the limitations, the limitations of the other. And whenever it, it sort of the, 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 the space of another person gets entered, um, here are the limits of what someone's interest of uh, concerning the unfolding of someone's interests and effects. But um, what it means, um, that the plurality gets stressed has a different meaning in different contexts. So in how far the interests of future generations has to be taken into consideration and how far this needs to be taken into consideration from, from a global context, sort of there is some, some global justice and the interest of, of you know, the financially less well of, the financially better of also need to be taken into consideration. But at the same time, um, um, radical plurality in the, insofar as the unfolding of one's own idiosyncratic needs and, and interests and fantasies are important. So that's why it, it, is not a, it is not a stable goal, it's not a stable utopia which we should aim for, but we always need to apply these insights, plurality, freedom, relationality, in the various contexts, in the various political contexts, and, and, and with the goal of trying to avoid paternalistic structures. And so the, the greatest amount of, of flour, flourishing of the plurality can be realized. And that is a very dynamic enterprise. And that is an enterprise which always needs to take into consideration the, the specific context of a situation, which is why it is difficult to formulate like, like a, any central outline or feature of an ideal future, which we should aim for. And, and so whenever issues arise, one has to look at the specific features in order to make recommendations. Mm -hmm. So given this answer, I would like to raise a challenge here. How does Stefan Zorner, as co-founder of Metahumanism, understand and predict the future of this intellectual movement? Because nowadays, transhumanism has its own role. But I was wondering if we are going to embrace metahumanism and we are going to rise uh, communities of researchers that are as equally devoted to metahumanism as they are already to transhumanism. Exactly, wonderful. Yes, um, I can see most of the departments historic in, in, in philosophy, even decision makers, legal institutions, are still extremely firmly, firmly rooted in our cultural historical past in the dualistic, categorically dualistic structures. So it needs to be stressed that, that these, these distinction between good, bad, material, immaterial, man, woman, um, technology, human, 
Um, these are all distinctions which all the implications are, are still rooted in encrusted structures of the past. And, and even though nowadays in academic circles, one finds an enormous interest both in transhumanism as well as in critical post-humanism. And um, one, one sees a certain discontentment with the implications of these histor cultural historical structures, which are so strong, in particular in Europe. I mean, I just want to stress that, for example, in, in Argentina, mm -hmm. personhood for an orangutan was granted, which, and, and, and whenever that legal issue came up in European, con in the European context, it was always said, no, um, the chimpanzee, the orangutan is not a person. And it's not a person legally means the orangutan should be treated like a thing, like an object. And it's just that treatment, which is so extremely strong in, in, in various parts of the world, in particular in Europe, um, it, which many people no longer find plausible. Mm -hmm. and, and, and more, and I can see it just as a development of the past 10 years, 15 years, um, more and more people find plausible that non-dualistic dynamic way of thinking, which is associated both with trans and post critical post-humanism. But there are, there are problematic features related to transhumanism as well as to critical post-humanism. Sort of some of the most, most extreme types of transhumanism think, well, in 15, 20 years, we, we already can upload our minds and we'll live as digital entities on a, on a hard drive, which I think that's not, not the most problem not the most plausible feature that <laughs> it's just not it's exaggerated um i'm not excluding the possibility but just in 20 years we cannot realize that and in the same way um sort of the critical post human is also taken to the extreme have some absurd implications have some problematic implications and basically if you if you if um, i there are here some examples to stress well um carbon dioxide emissions are being produced by humans no human produces no carbon dioxide emissions. So just as humans, we are necessarily causing more, more harm than we're doing good. So it's a human which is the problem. So the ideal goal for the, for the world we live in would be if human die, humans died out entirely. And there have been some scholars who are associated to critical post human who've made that suggestion. And so in the same way as I find that suggestion as just going over the top, Starting from a very plausible insight, I regard the same thing to be problematic concerning the mind uploading option within transhumanism. And so more and more people and the more and more sort of students of mine, I can see who am I presenting the ideas both of critical trans post-humanism and transhumanism to see that there, is, there, there are valid elements, there are important insights uh, with regard to both of these traditions and finding, finding finding the, the, the interesting insights, the plausible insights, and combining them. That's exactly what metahumanism does. And so um, I think um, there is less of a dogmatic duality mm -hmm. um, between like the fights of the radical transhumanism fighting against the radical critical post humanist and more and more people finding, well, there's something interesting in both of these traditions and we need to find we, we're both on the way of finding a non-dualistic way of dealing with that issues. And we've all realized the discriminatory structures related to our humanist past. And, and, and that's why, yeah, there will be much more interest and there already is much more interest in metahumanism. I've just seen references like explicit uh, description of metahumanism in, in a very interesting book related to black futures. Mm -hmm. coming out with Pelgrave. So, um, and, and, and because these movements are, are being received more and more strongly, I think um, there's also uh, more and more people who, who realize, well, finding a middle ground between uh, common features between critical post humanism and transhumanism is, is probably a very helpful way, a helpful way of finding, moving towards a non-paternalistic future. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking about that, as I read your work, I uh, totally understand that there are two major gaps somehow. Let's not call them yet delays. In accommodating the immersion and dynamics of new technologies with our immediate reality. So we lack a prompt legal response 
and we still react sometimes conservatory, quite some progressist, I would say, and I take the responsibility for this, uh, for this attribute, whenever it comes about upgrading human beings. So let's take them step by step. Is transhumanism evolving faster than the legal framework that supports emerging technologies of the so-called green, meaning genetics, robotics, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology? Definitely. Yeah, I've just realized that yesterday, yesterday I've had a discussion with a member of the German parliament. Okay. Uh, a public discussion was like quite a big audience, actually. And, and it was a member of the Liberal Party in, in, mm -hmm. in, in Germany. And one would think uh, that sort of the Liberal Party is the one which should be most, most liberal. Um, um, so they've got about like 10% of the votes. It's not, I mean, most of the parties, all of the parties have less than 30% right now, sort of right. uh, predictions. But it's, it's, a, it's a significant party, historically significant as well. Um, the other main parties are sort of the, the Christian Democrats who are more, you know, conservative in the outlook. Then, then we've got the Green Party, which is you know, nearly equally strong, who've also very, very hesitant concerning emerging technologies because of a very strong sense of nature and, and sort of team technologies being unnatural and so on. So they've got hesitations. Then there's a social social democratic party and it's their worries are the ones who have to do concerning emerging technologies who have to do with social inequality and i, I i'm so so the liberal party should be normally the one who's most open to these technologies and um but just in the discussion it was yesterday it was someone who also worked as a he was a theologian uh, who worked in the army and uh, for some time and, and actually the things he was, he was presenting, I thought he could have presented that in, in the most conservative party. Um, I, was, I was a bit shocked, I must say. Um, it, it sort of, it, but that already shows sort of the, the, how, how, how strong the tension is between what is being taken as, as, as just a regular discussion point within the transhumanist debate and what is actually being shared in, in specific European circles of the general population, at least of, the, of, of what even a, what a member of the Liberal Party in Germany takes, takes for granted. And that, that really corresponds with some other experience I've had in, in the past. And I, I, I sort of rem I remember I was at an event in, in Taiwan and there was the youngest invited speaker was a 15 year old. Oh. And, and, and he is part of a team in Silicon Valley who is, who's managed to create, who's played around with CRISPR-Cas9 with genome editing and who's uh -huh. realized to create uh, lactose out of yeast. And so he was actually having proper lactose which, without it being coming from a, from a cow and using the lactose to create real vegan cheese. And, and, and the general attitude in Taiwan was, well, that's a wonderful, that's a billion, you know, million dollars idea. That's a, you turn it into business. That's, now you're bringing together sustainability, green thinking, and together with gene technologies. And, and whenever I, I sort of, so there was an enormous enthusiasm, both in the, what I heard from in, in the reaction in the United States, as well as from the community in Eastern, Eastern Asia. And whenever I present these, the same idea in the, in the continental European context, in particular in German speaking countries, also Italy, but the sort of response was, well, that young boy, you know, he, he should have played around, you know, making drumming, playing with his drum running around the Christmas tree. He shouldn't play around with the gene, which probably will cause the end of humanity. It's he didn't have a use. And it's, it's, it's extremely dangerous what he's doing. He's playing around with human nature in the end. And sort of there's it's just concerning that response, you see what, what, what is widely taken as a, as a, you know, as a widely shared attitude, which is it's just extremely, extremely different from, from that in Eastern Asia and in, in the United States. So um, that's why, you know, and, and just realizing even a member of the most liberal party is, is, is from the perspective of what, what is being discussed also in, in, in these circles, post-human circles, it's just ex already still extremely removed. Um, and so in Europe, we have some 
we have, have a particularly conservative, worrying way of thinking about technology. And I would still make a difference also concerning maybe even the sort of uh, Western and, and Eastern Europe. And I think in Eastern Europe, one is even more open towards it as it is. That's why I, I, I find there's a lot of potential and, 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 real, and also a lot of interest in, in sort of the post-human thinking. So then this could provide a, a, no, a, a helpful basis for further flourishing and also well-being in, by relating, by being open, by embracing these technologies. Um, mm -hmm. We'll see what will happen here. Let's stay a little bit around this topic of democratic incursions that post-humanist and transhumanist thinking rises. In one of your lectures, you declared that we are not fully aware yet of the democratic implications of the use of our data. And speaking about democracies, I was wondering, do you consider that, I don't know, unlike Americans or Chinese that have another story, as we all know. Europeans delay in promoting health in an appropriate manner because of the internet policies of collecting data, because uh, I was uh, thinking, what would you say to those people that consider that it is no use to be healthy if you do not have freedom and freedom gets compromised by the use of data? I hear this kind of uh, argument all over the place. And I was wondering what would be the most appropriate reply to those kind of prejudgments that get flourishing from one side to another? This is probably one of the most important questions to deal with nowadays, and in particular in the situation we're currently in. And um, I, I can understand the worries actually, why many people are extremely worried about digital data being collected. And, and there is an enormous risk of them being abused, but actually what I'm trying to do, what I'm, I will show in detail in my forthcoming book, We've Always Been Cyborgs, is that freedom and, and privacy are, are, are different issues. And we can give up privacy entirely while, while keeping freedom, while even expanding on the notion of freedom. And I will, I will show you why this is so extremely important. So I would never give up freedom. Freedom is the central, it's a wonderful achievement. We, we need to cherish it. And, and most people who, who, who don't value freedom have never experienced what it's like to living in an unfree society. And so freedom is something I would never give up. Um, it's, it's an enormously important achievement. However, and, and this is the issue concerning the issues of digital data. Um, by not collecting digital data, we're actually undermining many of our interests, which we're, we're having. And that has to do with scientific research. This is to do with just the quality of life. And in particular, also with the health insurance, uh, with, with also promoting health by means of drug, by means of pharmaceutical companies, by pharmacies, drugs, which, which get developed. So what is the current usage of, of, of data and why is that problematic? So we've got on the one hand, the usage in the, in the United States and, and China as, as the most sort of dominant um, entities in that context. And in the United States, we've got big companies like Facebook and, and Google who basically collect everything, all the data they manage to get and they get further data by selling their own information to other institutions and or by exchanging it with other data from their in institutions. Mm -hmm. Then on the other hand, we've got the Chinese way of dealing with the digital data. And here that is even more efficient because the, the, the companies in the United States, they cannot enforce the clients to give up the data. I mean, the clients are, are not the clients. We are either the product or we are the workers. We are, we, you know, what, what the companies, the companies, we are just working for the, for the information which the companies use for marketing purposes. We are just there in order to make the companies in the US richer and richer. And in, the, in China, they are more efficient. They are collecting the data because, well, here, the state has got the right mm -hmm. um, to declare we can get all the data from all the various sources together. And whoever doesn't subscribe to the legal regulations like YouTube or Facebook, yeah, then you're simply banned from China. 
-hmm. And there's the, the, outside of China, we don't even have the right to enter, to, get, to collect the data from the 1.6 billion people who live in China. So here, and that's another interest or important insight to consider, the data, the internet is not even an, a, a global entity anymore. It's a local entity in China. And in Russia, they also wish to develop a, 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 such a local such a firewall as they have. They not only have the big wall in China, but they also have the, the big firewall in China in order right. for, the, for, for China just to collect all the data in China. But the Chinese also have the possibility to collecting data in the rest of the world in the, in the free internet. And by, by their big companies with TikTok and Huawei and, and the other companies. And that's why sort of actually, and, 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 and America has realized the importance and relevance of data. And that's why they've, that's why they've, they've, they've you know, that's why um, Huawei cannot offer Google products anymore. That's why there have been sort of the limitations of usage for TikTok or, and, and you cannot download TikTok in the United States anymore. Oh, you've made problems. People have, 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 have talked about um, limited, limited usage. So um, that, that's part of a digital war concerning digital data because digital data is connected to power and to financial well-being. Mm -hmm. and, and, and many say, so data is a new oil which is not quite true because oil is a natural product, but data, digital data is an intellectual property. But it's, it's, it is true in so far that both are related to power, to, to, to money, to insights. Um, and, and these two, two global powers, um, they also use it for scientific purposes. And here, China is even better than the United States. China has more peer-reviewed publications than the US. Mm -hmm. um, and that just shows the relevance of the data. And what are we doing in Europe? We, we have imposed the most digit, uh, rigid limitations um, concerning um, the usage of digital data. Um, and, and basically it becomes practically impossible to collect all the, all the information mm -hmm. in, in Europe. And what does that mean? We cannot use that for research purposes, for innovation purposes, for political decision makers, also for the development of health products, but also here during the pandemic crisis, we cannot get hold of the data in the appropriate manner. And that has already caused many, many human lives as a consequence. Um, but it, it will be further, because of the economic implication it has, it really undermines our strongest interest um, and, and as a consequence, the middle class will be the first who will be affected. They will be significantly worse off economically than the counterparts in the US and China. And once the middle class is worse off, they, they will look for scapegoats who are normally minorities, refugees, and so on. And that leads to internal tensions in, in Europe and maybe civil war. I mean, this is what... We, this is enormous. And the only reason why the Chinese will come over to Europe will be well because they, they love the Black Forest. They look the, you know, the, they want to have a croissant near the Eiffel Tower and, and in the Colosseum, they want to have a cappuccino. And, and then we will, we will be the one who will be performing traditional dances um, like Roman gladiators in the Colosseum. And this is all the touristic interest is the only reason why people come, come, come to Europe and the cultural diversity, but not for political success, economic success, innovation and economic flourishing. And that is really problematic. And that's why we desperately have to rethink the meaning of digital data. And we have to also use the digital data. And, but I don't want to infringe on freedom for nothing. And, but I, obviously there's a risk of once mm -hmm. the digital, digital data gets collected um, and um, um, there's always the risk of the, of the data being abused. But in order to have it, so we need the digital data for, for financial, scientific and so on reasons. Um, what, if the data is collected by big companies, it's, it, it's in their interest. And we don't know what they are doing with it. Um, so in order to actually have it used, uh, it needs to be um, collected by the government and, and such. But even the, if a government collects and human might, humans might have access to it and might humans can get corrupted and they would use it against the individuals. So it has to be collected, but well preserved. Mm -hmm. It must be very difficult to get access to this data. 
And it, it ought to be primarily a process <coughs> by, um, by algorithms. So humans don't have access to the digital data in order to risk uh, to 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 limit the abuse related to the digital data, and then we've got the personalized data which gets stored there, and then it 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 can be sold for the to the various companies to make research, and to develop new products and so on. But at that stage, the data needs to be depersonalized, so not personalized data gets gets out. But we could still be worried. One could still say, well. Um, now, in this, in, in such a situation, aren't isn't my property being taken away? Mm -hmm. Because digital data is intellectual property, and if the government forces me to to give up all, all my digital uh, my my own digital data, they basically take my intellectual property away, and that's a very good argument, and that's what I mean with a democratic usage of the data. No, if if, if that is being done by a government in Europe, then also the financial benefits must be in the human interest. Mm -hmm. What would be a human interest? A human interest is, and, and every human has a different interest, has different needs. There's a great diversity of human flourishing, a great diversity of, of things we long for, dream of, fantasies we have. But the one thing, the one thing which, according to psychological studies, more than 90% subscribe to is Health, health is an important issue and and health being healthy and having an increased health span is what you know many people identify with a higher quality of life be it intrinsically be it instrumentally health is in some way relevant mm -hmm. and this is one of the great achievements europe has we've got a public uh, health care system health insurance systems mm -hmm. and which basically means everyone you know, has, has a possibility uh, to having access to these health features. But it's extremely costly um, to uphold the system. And even within European countries, there are enormous differences. And I already realized the difference living in Italy, which the system is not as, doesn't offer as much as the system in Germany does, because mm -hmm. Germany is richer in the sense of what they pay for the health insurance than, than Italy. And, and so there are enormous differences within Europe. At least there is such a public health insurance. And, but it, it, it's extremely costly. And the more the technologies develop, the more expensive it gets. And so it needs to be financed. And so if we use the data in order to pay for the uh, uh, public health insurance, then, then that might be our way of, 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 of that would be a proper democratic usage of the data. It would not be that our, our data gets used in order to make the US companies richer and richer, or that the data goes to the you know, Chinese authoritarian system where it's being used in the interest of the, of the government. But that would be here the day we use the digital data get used in order to, in order to pay for a public health insurance. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, at the same time, in order to a, a limit also the, the the risk of us being sanctioned for for not for actions which don't deserve to be sanctions. Um, that we we need to increase the freedom even further, the freedom and plurality which we have even further. And and then and in many circumstances, once the data is 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 there available, of course it can also be used to sanction individuals. But it's, it, it is good in certain circumstances that individuals get sanctioned. So if, if, if someone an innocent gets murdered, then it's good that the person gets put into, into prison or if, if someone gets raped. And that's, it's good that the person gets sanctioned. But, but we need to make sure that people don't get sanctions for actions which don't deserve to be sanctions. And that's why we need to increase freedom much further. So if we increase freedom further and if we use the digital data um, for in order to support our private health insurance, uh, public health insurance, then sort of um, um, then then this shows that it's possible to to have to to save digital data. That the data can be used in our interest. That it promotes something which is relevant for us, but at the same time that it doesn't limit freedom. But on the contrary, um, that freedom can even be 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 promoted further, and the creative plurality can be realized. I, th I think that's an 
I haven't, I've discussed it with many people in many circumstances, and I have not heard one good argument against that. Um, of course, what the, 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 the common argument against is, okay, we cannot guarantee that sort of the political party who, who becomes the leading party is always using the data in the appropriate interest. And that's, that's, that's correct. And that's sort of the one thing which could be very strong. Obviously, if there's a wrong kind of party with totalitarian structures coming, um, getting elected, then, then having such a system of data collection could lead to a, a totalitarian system on an unprecedented scale, which would be extremely ter terrible. But, but, but um, we need to, this is up to us to prevent such a party from becoming the, the leading party. Um, but that is not a proper argument against against what I've been suggesting about uh, against the need to collect and use the, the personalized digital data, because advantages related to it concerning personal flourishing, economic building, health, um, is so important that um, any other way of dealing with digital data is undermining our very own interests. And I, I hope we'll be able to rethink. Um, uh, the meaning of digital data very soon, and I, the current the current legislation, the current recommendations by members of the AI Ethics Council, and I know many of them, they just I, I think they really undermine fundamentally our very own interests. And yeah, yeah, you describe actually quite a coherent balance there. But uh, I'm not afraid that we don't have the power to design proper public policies to implement that. I'm afraid that. People don't want to take responsibility for implementing it. And when I say people, actually, I say people that are empowered to lead, to govern, and to make this kind of increased freedom be more than coherent, uh, be a, a proper reality for ourselves and for our societies. And speaking about parties and speaking about these uh, multiple manners through which we could increase our liberties without abusing the concept of liberty and the borders of liberty. Uh, we have here a powerful political platform that raises questions regarding the power of transhumanism to shape a greater liberty. As this seems to be, at least, let's say at the first glimpse, the main task of post-humanism. So as it provides social inclusion, uh, resilience, tolerance, transhumanism equally fights for what some researchers call being a super democracy, which is not anarchism, but a paradigm that combines what I have uh, uh, many times heard from you as smart cities with upgraded humans on the one hand, <laughs> and technology, standards of increased well-being and protection of health, as you just said, on the other hand. Uh, in the US, there is a transhumanist party that fights for technological progress, bioenhancement, and life extension. So I would like to know from you, given your experience, what ideological position takes transhumanist politics on a political compass, on an ideological specter? Because there are powerful libertarian tendencies and democratic, not yet socialist tendencies of transhumanist politics. And I was wondering, how would you sell this idea to former communist states. We all know that in America, for example, this is already possible because America has its own democratic dream and tradition, which is quite different from the European framework of democracy. We cannot compare France with American democracy as fully compatible models. And thank God we have so many treaties and so many works, for example, the Tocqueville's contribution to the analysis of this kind of democracies. However, what would be the European trends of this political movement? Do you think that people really would vote for life extension? Do you think that a transhumanist party in Romania, for example, could have any chance for the next elections? Uh, it, it, you've got an excellent description, actually, of, of the political background ideas mm -hmm. related to transhumanism. So on the one hand, we do have, and that's normally what most identify most people in the sort of in the public uh, identify transhumanism sort of with the libertarian vampire mm -hmm. blood sucking transhumanists of uh -huh. Silicon Valley and actually some are blood sucking in the sense Peter Thiel well um, uh, there are sort of rumors um, which say um, that he's actually having blood injected from young people which is one way of, 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 of extending uh, yes. the lifespan 
and 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 he is extremely libertarian. He is sort of one of the he's one of the PayPal founders, and he regards himself as a as a transhumanist, and and he represents sort of that strand of libertarian transhumanism in in, in Silicon Valley, and many many unfortunately many identify transhumanism with that libertarian uh, idea, which would in the end lead to to an extremely radically um, hierarchical society of the very few rich and of the of the many uh, poor within a liberal democratic libertarian democratic framework um, which is i think a way of structuring the society which actually would undermine because of the power dynamics because of the hierarchy between the very few rich and the and the poor um, it leads to uh, power dynamics which undermines undermines freedom because mm -hmm. here sort of the issue of equality um, is, is, is cannot be properly considered uh, at all because anyone basically the poor are so poor that they might be worse off than slaves in ancient societies so so a certain economic equilibrium um, cohesion is needed for proper time of top, proper understanding of freedom and there are the transhumanists as you rightly noted who affirm that sort of social democratic understanding of 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 transhumanism, many of them are associated with the IIT Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. James Hughes is one of the sort of leading transhumanism, who, who transhumanists who deals with that kind of political understanding. He's even mixed quite, um, he's very strong on equality um, as well. I might be a bit more open than him, a bit more liberal, but these are more nuances within, within the debate. Um, and, and, and so one, the important thing is to realize that here, well, trans, and many critical post-humanists identify transhumanism exclusively with that libertarian outlook, mm -hmm. which, is, which, which is being upheld in, in Silicon Valley. And, I, I, and the others from the IT, which, who might not be as visible as like Kurzweil, Peter Thiel, and Elon Musk, I see these develop, or Sultan Isfahan, who's another one, um, see that kind of libertarian transhumanism extremely critical too. Um, and the approach um, of the social democratic versions of transhumanism uh, might actually be one which is rather well suited for the European context as well. Mm -hmm. Where it's, I mean, freedom is an important achievement, but freedom is, it must, must coexist with, with other enormous achievements as well. Like, like the um, 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 uh, universal um, public health insurance and, and uh, other like civil liberties which have been uh, established. So it's not a libertarian solution. So that workers are just well protected. You know, um, vacation days in the US in the initial years after employment, you only have two weeks of uh, vacation days here. We've got 30 days in Europe. Um, there are many, many more um, ways of protecting um, well, of, of protecting a social cohesion, of not leading to that extreme hierarchical structures uh, which you have in, in the United States, um, while, while still cherishing, you know, having freedom as a central achievement. And um, at the same time, and, and that would be a difference to sort of our historical past, which we have in, in Europe, and that might be something which particularly appeals also to, to Eastern European uh, countries. Um, in the Western Part, there has been a strong mm -hmm. reference to also, I mean, in the German foundational law, there's an explicit reference to God, um, which means to a monotheistic God. And, and, and this leads, our atheist naturalist skeptics are not really well represented as part of that constitution. Mm -hmm. And, and so, so a move, moving away, and that doesn't mean that one has to, one shouldn't undermine any possibilities of belief. You know, this is, it's not being a dualist understanding of a constitution being, being substituted with a, with a, you know, an atheist naturalist one. Um, that wouldn't be the right kind of move. proper plurality and freedom needs now. Um, probably a laicist solution where, where sort of the religious domains and the, and the political domains get, get separated more strongly. And, and, and so, um, and transhumanism could could provide such an such a basis, which also has sort of in in the Eastern Eastern European tradition, where there has been much more of a hesitation concerning 
religious understandings from on a political basis um, and, and much more of an equality also concerning sort of gender equality has been much more strongly established in Eastern European countries. And these are issues if they get appropriately integrated, uh, it doesn't have to be a transhumanist party, um, but at least um, some party which takes up these various notions and integrates them um, could, could implement twist it's, it's, it's I, I talk about to twist rather than overcoming. Twisting means integrating various strands which you have and bringing them together in a new kind of unity. And so um, um, there are many achievements which people have from the from the Eastern European past, which are clear achievements which can be integrated. There are many traces from the Western European background which can be integrated. And um, and that would still be a European way of dealing with it. And many European achievements coming together. And, and the important aspect would be, I mean, still it is still freedom, just like in, in the United States, but it's not that libertarian freedom. It's more one which considers other civil rights, which, which the protection of minorities, the protection of workers, the kind of equality is much more, more strongly considered in these backgrounds. But at the same time, it, it, it shouldn't be so strongly related to a um, sort of religious understanding only since sort of religious people have that higher grounding, it would rather be a more more balanced concerning the various interest groups. Um, so social democrats around. would have much more to win if exactly. they would embrace a little bit the values of transhumanism. Exactly, definitely. And that could be a way of developing further of also having some Mm -hmm. sort of a, economic interest being rather promoted and it is extremely important sort of the innovation scientific technological aspects lead to innovation and dwelling and one mustn't underestimate and that's I think something which in Eastern European countries is also being understood uh, because of the historical development that how important it is sort of the financial aspect for the quality of life for financing health insurances and that's something which Many in the Western part, like they don't realize. They think the money is just there. It's, it's an extremely naive understanding. So that, with the focus on the usage of the digital data or innovation, you know, um, we will live in a globalized world. And if we don't make the money, the money goes to uh, China or the United States. But a certain financial grounding is is needed for well-being and for for. Uh, properly functioning health system. So um, adopting and integrating these elements in a, in a political, in a political party, political system um, could realize a more sustainable and 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 all, all, uh, a future full of also which takes economic well-being and and a good health system into consideration. I think that's something um, which we're all interested in. Mm -hmm. I would like to move now a little bit from the idea of human autonomy to your books in which you discuss the dynamics of this idea from many transhumanist standpoints. Last year, which has been, despite the pandemics, a good year for your intellectual work <laughs> on transhumanism got published. Congratulations for that. Uh, we embrace it. And uh, after reading it, uh, what drew my attention in particular was the attempt to demythicize a little bit transhumanism. And it seemed to be quite necessary at the moment when you wrote down this book. I think that this domain has not been excused by prejudgments nor by narratives that put on the spot taboo subjects. Uh, and there are still taboo subjects from some societies, even from, from Eastern uh, Europe, not only from, from the Western part, such as, I don't know, self-design, immortality, upgraded individuals, that sooner or later converged towards the same fear, that of overextending human autonomy. We have this obsession with the limits of our liberty. So how does your research respond to these mythological patterns? Yeah, wonderful. Um, extremely important. And this is something I should have mentioned earlier, actually. Something like immortality is something which comes up and being, um, being referred to by, trans, by, by transhumanists very often. But um, immortality is not a realistic option. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's just it's just taking in a naturalist background. We've got the Big Bang, 
expanding universe maybe in the end there will be contraction you know how should we ever survive that you know immortality is not an option anyone who suggests that as a transhumanist um sh if if this is a serious transhumanist i hope that person doesn't mean it literally because we we should definitely forget about that however um an expanded lifespan is something which is extremely, extremely important. And I'm not, shouldn't even speak about an expanded lifespan. I should talk about an ex expanded health span. And, and, and what we take here into consideration is, is sort of our historical developments. Just looking back 200 years in, in time in Europe, and we've had an average life expectancy of 40 years, 200 years ago. Now the average life expectancy is 80 years. And even in the most in, in some of the poorest countries in the world, it is higher nowadays than it is it is in in like developed in more developed Europe 200 years ago. So um, as a consequence of of the technological in, uh, innovations and developments, <coughs> and I take and I technology here in a, in a broad sense. So it also includes hygiene. It includes education. Um, obviously, vaccinations and, and antibiotics and, and anesthetics. So um, as a consequence of all of these developments, the average quality of life, the average lifespan, health span has increased all over the world. And so it's not just the de development which is in the interest of the, of the developed, of the economically uh, developed countries, but even in Nigeria, one nowadays has, has an average lifespan of 50, 60 years, whereas, it, you know, which is not perfect, you know, but it, it is, it, it, you know, it's better than it was in, in Europe 200 years ago. So even here one can see developments. And obviously it's not even when it comes to other issues like uh, availability of drugs. It is good that a drug is available in order to cure diseases. And, and then we need to make sure to make it available in, 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 in the various parts of the world. But even here we see like avail availability of drugs treating um, HIV mm -hmm. um, was, was available like to 10% about 15, 20 years ago. Um, and now it, the global access has, has been increased to, to two thirds of the, of the population who are HIV positive. And that is just, you know, it's, it, as I said, it's not perfect, mm -hmm. but sort of it is better than if we, if we did not have um, these HIV treatments. And, and there's, there's been a permanent increase concerning the making, making available these technologies in, in various parts of the world. And, um, and looking back or analyzing the contemporary structures in the world, and there's still many challenges to be to being seen, economic challenges and, and, and problematic power structures and abuses of, 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 of big pharmaceutical companies and neocolonial structures. And one could, could see all that. And I'm, I'm not saying we live in a perfect environment. How, however, it also needs to be recognized. For example, if you look back again, just 200 years and our world in data, which is hosted by the University of Oxford is a very, is a reliable source on that, on these issues. Mm -hmm. So you can find there was an absolute po poverty rate in, 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 in the UK, which was more than 80% 200 years ago. And I'm not talking about a relative poverty rate, but an absolute poverty, which means the same type of criteria have been applied over, over the various periods of time, which has mean people actually striving for the survival in, in various, you know, in, in just, just having food to eat and a place to live in. And, and so it was 80% in the UK. It was more than 90% 200 years ago. And now on a global scale, we've got an absolute poverty rate of about 10%. Mm -hmm. As I said, 10%, there are still too many people, you know, suffering right. and starving to death. But, but, you know, at least as a consequence, and, and, and this is related to technological innovations and, and developments. And, you know, 10% is better than 90%. Um, so, and, and, and if we work on further on that issue, it will improve even further. And so it shows it's not just in, in the interest of the privileged few, it is in the general interest. And that goes further to issues. So moving again from global justice issue also to issues concerning, concerning the environment and issues like overpopulation. And um, because overpopulation is obviously a major driving force with carbon dioxide emissions. So there are many correlations. And you can see that um, 
and that's been analyzed by the economist who's, who's hosting the website Our World in Data, actually. And you can see sort of education, uses of technologies, hygiene, a certain financial well-being has also consequences on the reproduction rate. Mm -hmm. and, and we can see that and, and, and sort of South, countries like um, Pakistan and, and, and South Africa have, have, have even come up to the highest development concerning the availability of economic and educational resources. And that has, has led to an enormous drop concerning the reproduction rate. And we can see that happening in, in, in the lesser developed countries all over the world. Mm -hmm. and, and given that development, and given, given that this can be realized, and it can only be realized by technological innovations, um, we can, we, uh, he comes to the conclusion, and he's, he's founded that on, on very well-structured uh, statistical mathematical research. Mm -hmm. um, he comes to the conclusion that given that development, we've got reasons to hold that the 13th billionth person on Earth might ne never have been born. Because even if we live longer, mm -hmm. um, because of the drop in the reproduction rate, which is related to economic building with, with hygiene and with, with education, um, the reproduction rate goes down so much that, that so un, uh, over, over a population should not be an issue. And that has enormous consequences also concerning issues like climate change, carbon dioxide emissions, production of meat, and so on. Uh, and so, um, um, we can't return to a state of nature where we don't want to live on, on trees again. We, we cherish these achievements, you know, from antibiotics to anesthetics. So technology has to be the answer also for issues concerning, you know, for global issues like climate change or, or global justice. And, and, and if we take the, the, the realistic empirical data into consideration, we've got a good grounding for, for already saying we are, we are, we're on a good track. The situation is not perfect, but on a historical perspective, we're actually on a very good track. And actually, I, think that's yeah. I was thinking about the fact that many people say nowadays that this earth no longer supports us, has no longer so many resources to have us all here. And transhumanist approach says the fact that we are not only able to extend our life, but we also have the power to produce resources that could somehow support this kind of life expansion. Now, um, given the fact that we have reached here uh, this topic, which is quite sensitive for some of us, but we all know that there are still voices that assume that transhumanism is an ideological construct that embraces the ambition to transcend biological existence. But as you say, not in order to achieve immortality, but in order to increase your life somehow. Uh, and when we say increasing life, we have into our uh, perspective two different things. So uh, you live more and you live better. Somehow they, they come together. Um, however, it is an ongoing process with many metaphysical, material, and moral implications that I have no ambition to discuss right now, given the limited time that we have at our disposal. But I would ask you, uh, if uh, transhumanism isn't more an alternative to the fear of death than a concept that awakes fear by itself. Yeah, um, it does awake fear. Um, you're right, sort of that's why Francis Fukuyama, mm -hmm. when he was asked concerning his, he was asked, he's a famous political, conservative political critic, and he was asked, in the foreign policy magazine, what is the, the most dangerous idea in the world? He responded, it's, it's transhumanism. So um, yes, um, I, can, I, I can understand that. If you hold on to a very, very, very conservative, maybe natural law understanding, then the ideas which have been um, presented by transhumanism can be worrisome, um, in particular concerning concerning you, you wish to uphold them some very essentialist concept of what the good consists of. Um, you have an anthropocentric perspective. And, and this is what, what people hold on to, but one doesn't realize, they don't take seriously, sufficiently into consideration that we as humans, I mean, as homo sapiens, 
we have had com the last common answers of us and great apes was six million years ago. Mm -hmm. The Homo sapiens have come about, you know, nowadays we think about 400,000 years ago. The Homo sapiens sapiens maybe been around for 50,000 years. Uh, we're using now the usage, the public usage of the internet has been there since for about 30 years, since 1990, 31 years. So um, that's, and it's radically changing the life we're, we're living in already. And that shows, I mean, just sort of getting that, that oversight concerning the various steps of develop, development, having the understanding, oh no, this has always been like that. That's essential understanding. We've got a natural, there's a human nature, which is unchanging. Um, uh, no, that's, that's not a very plausible take. And this is just, if you know, we humans have come about, give it another 400,000 years, will we still here? Given the, just that evolutionary development, no, I'm, I'm, I don't think we'll be, I mean, the chances are very high that we will not be here. It's actually, ex we can exclude the possibility that we'll still be here then. We'll already, we, we are permanently evolving, we're permanently changing. And now we've got the possibility to actually, we, we take our evolution into our own hands. We can, I mean, we've already be, always been doing that. Now we can take it more strongly, doing it with, with related to, to gene technologies and digital technologies. Mm -hmm. And obviously for the ones who think, and there's a, there's, a, there's a human nature, which is unchanging, which has always been there. And, and there are human laws and, and, and which should, should I always have to be apply and have to be enforced for those who think that um, yeah no sexuality should only be used for reproductive purposes and only if you have the possibility of reproduction you should have sex then and for those it, it might be a dangerous idea but nowadays with transhumanism also we get we disentangle sexuality from reproduction mm -hmm. um, and then that has started with the use of condoms with the use of pill with the use of now we're doing artificial wombs. We're doing uh, in vitro uh -huh. fertilization. We use and and, and you know, in, in Holland they're currently developing an artificial uterus. So and 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 so this is we can see various ways of of, of you know sexuality being related to pleasure and and reproduction becomes a technical technical feature becomes mm -hmm. something which could be even realized without without the ex of actual sexuality and so uh, so if you hold on to the notion that there's a one man one woman having sex for reproductive purpose that's the only idea the only valid foundation for having for having sex in the first place um then for those transhumanism is a dangerous idea because we already have established the possibility the uk it's already legal that there are two women and a man who can basically um, have their eggs and sperms removed and it's all being like yeah. uh, put together and you can have a, have a child with three biological parents. And if there's a, you know, if there was a lesbian couple who was interested in having biologically related offspring, in principle, that could be done. If there were two women and a man who would want to live together, then there could be good reasons for um, using that technology of having sexually uh, biologically related offspring and there are good reasons why that sh they should also be granted to get married if this is in the interest so this is obviously so you can see the enormous tensions obviously concerning that what has been dominant maybe in the past 1000 years but it's it's taking the wider perspective like a big historical perspective and you realize that it's it's just a very you know it's this essentially is anthropocentric uh, claims logocentric um understanding is, is just not a very plausible stance that my, you know just because something has been valid for a certain period of time that doesn't mean that it's this is like an eternal nature which is being founded and and you know taking the wider perspective you need to realize now things are undergoing permanent change and we are also changing it's it's, it's sort of that heraclitean stance we are in the process of permanent becoming in all respects at all times and and this is taken seriously by by transhumanism and 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 so you need to, to have a dynamic integrity. You you always have some kind of integrity in guiding roles and values and norms, but be always being willing to adapt and alter, given the altered circumstances. And that's something which is I think is extremely important to take on board. And 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 the dangerous dangerous um, discriminatory structures are related to this essentialist dualistic. Um, distinctions, good and evil, and so on. And so it's also a way of getting rid of discriminatory, dualistic, paternalistic structures. Um, that's why, yeah, I can understand um, sort of the hesitations or regarding transhumanism as dangerous, 
But I think it's a type of dynamic dynamic way of thinking which we can't es es escape because it's it's just given the the ontological structures of the world the world is permanently in process of change and we need to realize and adapt that and not hold on to an, an, an unchanging nature which simply is yeah, actually I, I i totally accept that ontologically we assist to a, a reshaping from the beginning to the end but uh, i think that the, this is the biggest test that confessional institutions should overcome and they deal with some reticent perspectives because even though they encourage love, they encourage affection, uh, they still have to deal with this idea that a child can have three parents or four parents. And this is something that goes beyond the natural expectation to provide life and to entertain life somehow. And I think that this is uh, one of the most sensitive topics that our Christian societies will deal with and I think that uh, we could bridge here a path for dialogue through tolerance, for compassion, and for understanding the fact that if religious institutions have on their agenda promoting life, then they should consider how do you achieve this life and how can you support, let's say, a more uh, progressist, but not radical progressist attitude towards uh, having life assured somehow. Uh, now, given the fact that maybe just just as a short comment, I, I, we should stress that I don't want to create actually that tension between that there has to be tension between sort of Christian and mm -hmm. humanist attitude. Mm -hmm. And um, I've got a friend; he's a full professor in Germany in, in Bochum. Mm -hmm. He's a transhumanist and a professor of Catholic theology. He only be, you know only become professor of Catholic theology if you get the approval from the Vatican. So you know it, it's not. Uh, it is it is possible that doesn't have to be tension. I was just invited by Concilium, a you know, leading Catholic journal, and each article gets translated into six languages in order to to deal with that aspect of mm -hmm. relationship between religion and, and transhumanism. And I also stressed the possibilities, but it you know of how how that can come together. And I think it can come together, but it needs some kind of also re re reinterpretation of how to deal with religious attitude. It's a sort of more f focusing on the virtue of love. The openness to towards the other, the differences, but still being based on a you know you could base it in a, in a, in a uh, on on the virtue of love, which has been stressed by Saint Paul. So and and that could lead to a great plurality of different kinds of unfolding. Um, it's it's sort of let the others do what they act on the basis as as long as it's done out of love, um, and then we should avoid being violent concerning others. And if you stress these type of attitudes, um, there's a good way of revising Christianity, twisting Christianity, still being true to it, but it, there doesn't have to be a conflict concerning, concerning transhumanist attitudes. Just. Mm -hmm. So we talked about life, we talked about human existence, and here we go to your last book that you've been working on. Uh, we have always been cyborgs. So I was wondering, how did it come to you, such a title? And what does it mean that we have always been cyborgs? Are we right now two cyborgs logged on Zoom talking about something? We are cyborgs. <laughs> but even if we were not talking on Zoom, um, yes, this is actually a new understanding concerning the human. And and let me let me give you a short description um, mm -hmm. of why you, why I am um, a cyborg. Um, and that applies to all the other uh, uh, humans as well. Um, sort of the human cyborg, just taking literally, is constituted out of um, cybernetic organism. Mm -hmm. Organism? Well, we are organisms. Clearly, we're carbon um, carbonate-based creatures, organisms. Um, and and cy cyborg uh, also has a Kubernetes, the cyber element. Mm -hmm. And Kubernetes is a helmsman, the steers person of a ship. So the ones who's responsible for guiding it. And so we've got, been guided, we've been steered organisms. And the steering occurs also by, already by the human parental intervention after birth. We, we, get, we learn a language, we get upgraded by means of a language. It's a, that's a steering process. So it's not that the language comes from somehow outside, from higher up. It, it, it's not something we, we, when we once we're born, we already have the language, and language is sort of the central feature, which um, which is always defined 
human beings. That's what we've seen as, as being why we humans have a special capacity because of language. Language, reason is based upon language. We need language and reason are closely interconnected, the capacity to, to make inferences, logic, intellect. Um, and so, um, but this capacity which we receive as a consequence of of the parental upgrade which we receive, or educational upgrade, environmental we, we upgrade, we permanently develop that further as part of our school education, further capacities, historical, mathematical, and so on. And 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 so it's a permanent it's a permanent way of of upgrading upgrading in the sense we develop capacities which we didn't have before. Education is enhancement. Learning a language is a type of enhancement. That's why enhancement doesn't have to be something morally problematic. So taking the stance that we've always been sidewalk is, is means that since, you know, in the same way as we've been defining homo sapiens, homo sapiens sapiens by the capacity of language, sort of once we have the developed the capacity of language and we pass it on and it's related to knowledge. That's what, what, what is so striking about humans. Our knowledge doesn't get lost when once we die, mm -hmm. but we can preserve it by means of words, by means of you know art, artifacts, and that is how we can accumulate a lot of knowledge and get more. And by means of digital enterprises, that yeah, that process can be exponentiated in, on an unprecedented scale. Um, so it, it's this kind of understanding uh, which which makes all of us turns all of us as we use language and all the related features into cyborgs it's a it's a new understanding of our anthropology and as a consequence of that understanding the the usage of implementing brain computer interfaces of genetic intervention is something is it's not something radically new or something categorically new it's something which is part of our being human we've always used technologies in order to increase the chance of us living good lives and and so um it's not it's it, it is sort of a new technology it's but it's not something um which leads to categorically new features but in the same way as we, what we've been doing with language learning and uh, mathematics is what we can do by means of brain computer interface and that's why we also need to apply this the, the appropriate analogous moral attitude so there's uh, some good features there are some bad features once once um, the, the technologies are being used to for for child abuse then they need to be abandoned but once they get abused for the for the appropriate features then then they should be approved and and so it's it's a, this revised way of thinking about the human also leads to an improved openness concerning the usage of these new technologies for for the purpose or enhancement because this is what has been the goal of education for for, for all the times it's, it's meant to uh, enhance the offspring in order to increase their chance of living good lives. And that's what we all want. You know, Stefan, I was listening to you and I recall Steve Fuller's appreciation that you have the makings of becoming Slaughter Dyke's evolutionary successor. How do you react to this appreciation? <laughs> <laughs> it is interesting how other people actually reacted to that because um, they have been, this has been seen as rather critical in the German context sometimes because Lotte died has a certain reputation not only because of what he said but because of some of it what his students said one of his, his assistants I've, I've failed but um I, I I sort of the way I I see um Slaughter Dyke is you know he became particularly striking as part of the debate with Habermas and uh, rules concerning the human zoo and then Habermas accused Slaughter died of being a being a transhumanist, but actually in, in 2005 in a, in a lecture in Tübingen, and he said, no, genetic um, technologies should not be used for enhancement purposes, but only for, 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 for therapeutic purposes. So he's an extremely bioconservative. So in that respect, I definitely separate myself from slaughter diet, you know, in general. Mm -hmm. However, when I read sort of the critique of cynical reason from slaughter diet, I was laughing. It was a, you know, very open-minded, liberating way of dealing with it to which I was uh, strongly able to relate myself to. Mm -hmm. And he's had an enormous impact, definitely sort of besides the, you know, some, some problematic implications. He's, 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 he's written in very stimulative fashion, who's, who's, who's 
manage, you know, produce some really stimulating works. And it, it doesn't matter whether I agree with them or disagree with them. I do agree with some, disagree with others. But he's had enormous impact and in, in culturally shaping our way of thinking. So it is, I regard it as a praise. And, and it was meant as a praise. I mean, Fuller was, um, Professor Fuller was responsible for actually um, a slaughter dyke being awarded an honorary doctorate at the University of Warwick. So he clearly has a high estimation for, for Slotterdijk's works. And, and, and this is how I take it. Um, and, and I don't have to agree with everything that Slotterdijk says, and I can, you know, to, but, but this judgment, so um, it, it's, it, I'm unhappy with it. Um, I'm fine with it, <laughs> even though other people might see us as more ambiguous than I do. So Stefan, I think that we have reached the end of our conversation, but before that, we have a small line of yes or no questions if you would take the challenge. Oh, please no. go ahead. I, I'm not sure about the, the yes or no question, but <laughs> they are possible. As a philosopher, that's always a big challenge and issue. I'm, I'm not that's sure why we do it. Yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> but they are friendly, so if yeah. you agree, here we go. Does Stefan Zorner enjoy spending some free time consuming cyberpunk culture? Of course. So strong, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Is immortality one of your dreams? I, I definitely, you know, immortality is not a realistic option. So I, I don't like to dream of stuff which I don't think can be realized. Mm -hmm. Nice one. Have you ever felt annoyed by the reputation of the bad boy of philosophy? Oh, it's, it's, isn't it? That's, it's, it's quite an intriguing, you know, way of caption. I, I quite liked it actually when I read it. It was <laughs> first coined by a journalist um, who actually writes for the. I think he writes for the Zeit, and he wrote it in, a, in for a radio feature on me, and that was so so. Yeah, no, it's it's a quite nice line. <laughs> mm, quite popular. <laughs> so, if Stefan Zorner would ever have the chance to upload his mind, would he do that? Here, I definitely can't say yes or no. Yeah, I mean, in principle, <laughs> actually, I would do it. Actually, no, if it's reliable. If it is, it is it, it, sort of the risk of side effects is low, then I would definitely do it. I mean, it, it would be, it's, it's, it's fun to having good experiences. You know, I might be uploaded, then downloaded into the female body. I might have different experiences. <laughs> I'd be curious if that works in a reliable fashion. I don't think it will happen in the near future. So, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about new experiences. So, <laughs> <laughs> so okay. I was just imagining how that would be. <laughs> so as transhumanism reflects a revolutionary intellectual movement, would it have the strength to produce at least cultural, if not political revolutions? Yes or no? It already does so, yes, clearly strongly. I can, I mean, I'm not only dealing with these issues from, from, a, from a philosophical point, but if you look at bio art and the amazing work by Eduardo Kach, um, this is sort of how transhumanism already shapes, has, has brought about a paradigm shift in the history of art, and there's there are much more intriguing works to come in the future. So yeah, strong yes. Mm -hmm. And last question, do you think that transhumanist politics has any future in Eastern Europe? Oh yeah, definitely. So what I said before, by bringing together the strands, it might actually be the most plausible way of finding a proper European way which also takes uh, appropriately into consideration the particular or uh, eastern european past so mm -hmm. i'm very hopeful in that respect who knows thank you very much stefan for sharing oh, your many, time with us it was <laughs> many, many 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 thanks for that and kind of whenever the pandemic allows it you know that you are more than welcome to our faculty so just give us a call and we make the setups okay <laughs> oh wonderful many thanks i'm already looking forward to meeting up with you in bucharest in rome or wherever else in the world so hopefully we'll do that soon thank you Stephen, very much many, many, good evening everyone